Welcome back to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, taking a plunge into something absolutely fundamental, something you encounter constantly, but maybe don't think about its, well, its hidden complexities. We're talking about water. Just H2O, right. But it's so much more than that. Its unique properties are literally the stage on which the drama of life unfolds. It's the solvent, the medium, Everything happens in water. Exactly. And that's our mission today. We're digging into Chapter 2 of Leninger Principles of Biochemistry, 8th Edition Water, The Solvent of Life. We want to unpack why it's so special. We'll look at its basic properties, these crucial weak interactions, and uh, the whole business of pH and buffering. Yeah, it's like getting the insider's guide to life's most essential molecule. Why is it the solvent of life? We're going to find out. All right, let's start with water's unique properties and these weak interactions. It's kind of mind-blowing that water makes up, what, 70% or more of most living things. Easily. And you have to remember, life started in water. Evolution happened in an aqueous world, so water's properties profoundly shaped, well, everything about biology. Every molecule, every cell structure, it's all adapted to water. Absolutely. And a huge part of that adaptation comes down to one incredibly important interaction, the hydrogen bond. Okay, hydrogen bonds. Let's break that down. The water molecule itself, H2O, the oxygen atom is more electronegative, right? It pulls the electrons closer. That's right. So the oxygen ends up with a little bit of a negative charge. We call it a partial negative charge. And the hydrogens, they get a partial positive charge. So each water molecule acts like a tiny magnet with positive and negative ends. Pretty much. It has these electric dipoles, and that's the key. The slightly negative oxygen on one water molecule feels an electrostatic pull towards a slightly positive hydrogen on a neighboring water molecule. And that attraction is the hydrogen bond. That's it. Usually shown as like three little parallel lines and diagrams. And this seems simple, but it explains so much about why water is weird compared to other similar molecules. Totally. Think about its boiling point, melting point the energy needed to turn it into vapor. They're all way higher than you'd expect for a molecule of its size. Without hydrogen bonds, water would probably be a gas at room temperature. Wow, so it's these bonds holding the liquid together, giving it this internal cohesion. Exactly. Now, an individual hydrogen bond isn't super strong, maybe only about 5% uh, of the strength of a covalent OH bond within the molecule itself. So weak individually. Right. About 23 kilojoules per mole compared to, say, 470 for an OH bond. But, and this is the crucial part, there are just so many of them in liquid water. Ah, uh, power of numbers. Precisely. And they're not static. They're constantly breaking and reforming incredibly fast. We talk about flickering clusters. Flickering clusters. I like that visual. How fast are we talking? Like picoseconds. 1 to 20 picoseconds is the lifetime of a single bond. But because there are so many, the overall effect is this massive internal cohesion. And that's different in ice, right? Yeah. yeah, in ice, each water molecule forms a perfect set of four hydrogen bonds with its neighbors. This creates a very regular open crystal lattice structure. Which is less dense than liquid water. Exactly. That's why ice floats, a property that's, you know, incredibly important for life in cold climates. In liquid water, the structure is less ordered, more dynamic. Molecules are closer on average. Each molecule is bonded to about 3.4 others at any given moment. And this constant making and breaking of bonds, that ties into thermodynamics too, doesn't it? Melting and boiling. Absolutely. Melting ice or boiling water, they absorb heat, they're endothermic, but they happen spontaneously because there's a huge increase in entropy in the randomness and freedom of the water molecules. It's driven by that AGH equation. The large positive entropy change wins out. Okay, so water bonds with itself. Not all the time. But it also bonds with other things, right? Polar salukes. Yes. That's key to it being the solvent of life. Sugars, yeah. alcohols, anything with OA or NH groups. Water can form hydrogen bonds with them too. That's what makes them soluble, makes them dissolve. And the way these bonds form matters. Their direction. Oh, definitely. Hydrogen bonds are strongest when the three atoms involved are in a straight line. This directionality is absolutely critical for building the precise 3D shapes of proteins and DNA. Those structures rely heavily on specific directed hydrogen bonds. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are huge. What about when water interacts with things that have full charges, like ions from salt? Right, water is a fantastic polar solvent for charged stuff, hydrophilic molecules. When you dissolve salt, NaCl, in water, 
the water molecules cluster around the positive sodium ions and the negative chloride ion. They kind of surround them. Exactly. They hydrate the ions. The partially negative oxygens point towards the positive sodium, and the partially positive hydrogens point towards the negative chloride. This stabilizes the ions in solution. And it weakens the attraction between the ions themselves. Precisely. It effectively shields them from each other. This is related to water's very high dielectric constant. It's a measure of how well a solvent screens electrostatic charges. Water's is really high, about 78.5. So it makes it much harder for the ions to find each other and reform the salt crystal. Yep. And again, entropy is a big player here. When the salt crystal dissolves, the ions go from being locked in a lattice to freely moving around in solution. That's a massive increase in disorder, in entropy, which makes dissolving thermodynamically favorable. Okay, that covers polar and charged things. But what about nonpolar stuff, like oils or gases like oxygen? They don't dissolve well. Right, they're hydrophobic water-fearing. And the reason is, again, entropy. When a nonpolar molecule enters water, it can't form hydrogen bonds. Instead, it disrupts the existing water network. How so? The water molecules around the nonpolar molecule are forced to arrange themselves into a highly ordered sort of cage-like structure to maximize their own hydrogen bonding around the intruder. Ah, so forcing order onto the water which decreases the water's entropy. Exactly. And that's energetically unfavorable. The system doesn't like that decrease in randomness. So how does the system respond? The nonpolar molecules tend to cluster together. Think of oil drops merging in water. By clumping, they minimize the total surface area they expose to the water. Reducing the amount of ordered water needed. Precisely. This allows more water molecules to return to their more disordered, higher entropy state. This whole process, nonpolar things clumping together to minimize disruption of water is called the hydrophobic effect. And this hydrophobic effect must be huge in biology. Absolutely critical. It's the main driving force behind the formation of cell membranes, those lipid bilayers. The fatty acid tails, being nonpolar, cluster together away from water. It's also essential for protein folding. The nonpolar amino acids tend to bury themselves in the protein's core. Wow, okay. Are there any other weak interactions we need to mention? Well, briefly, there are van der Waals interactions. These are even weaker, very short-range attractions that happen between any two atoms that get very close. They arise from temporary fleeting fluctuations in electron clouds that create momentary dipoles. So they're not based on permanent charges or hydrogen bonding? Mm -hmm. Nope. Just proximity. They're individually tiny, but if you have a lot of atoms packed closely, they can add up, contributing to stability, like in the core of a protein or where a molecule fits snugly into an enzyme's active site. Okay, so let's pull this together. We have hydrogen bonds, ionic interactions, the hydrophobic effect, van der Waals forces. Mm -hmm. None are very strong on their own. Right. Compared to covalent bonds, they're weak. But the key is their cumulative effect. Biology harnesses the power of large numbers of these weak interactions. To do what exactly? To create stable yet flexible structures. Think protein folding, DNA double helix stability, enzyme binding to its substrate, antibody binding to an antigen. It's all governed by the sum total of these weak forces. They allow for specific recognition and also for dynamic changes. Even tightly bound water molecules tucked inside proteins can be crucial for function. Amazing. Okay, let's shift focus a bit to another property, osmotic pressure. This feels different. It is, but it's still deeply connected to water's behavior. Osmotic pressure is one of the colligative properties. Colligative, meaning they depend on the number of sulu particles, not what they are. Exactly, like boiling point elevation or freezing point depression. It's about the concentration of things dissolved in the water. And importantly, if a solute dissociates, like NaCl breaking into Na plus and Cl, it counts as two particles for colligative purposes, whereas glucose stays as one. Got it. So what is osmosis? It's the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane, a membrane that lets water pass, but not necessarily the solutes. Water tends to move from an area where its concentration is higher, meaning fewer solutes, to an area where its concentration is lower, meaning more solutes. Trying to dilute the more concentrated side. Essentially, yes. <laughs> it's driven by the tendency of the system towards greater randomness or entropy, water spreading out more evenly. The pressure required to stop this water movement is the osmotic pressure. And this has huge implications for cells. Massive. If you put a cell in a solution with the same solute concentration as inside an isotonic solution, nothing much happens. But put it in a hypertonic solution, one with more solutes outside. Water leaves the cell and it shrinks. Right. And in a hypotonic solution, fewer solutes outside. 
water rushes in and the cell swells, maybe even bursts, that's osmotic lysis. Exactly. So living things need strategies to deal with this. Like what? Well, plants and bacteria have rigid cell walls to prevent bursting. Some single-celled organisms have contractile vacuoles to pump excess water out. And what about us, animals? We maintain the osmolarity of our body fluids very carefully. Our blood plasma has a specific concentration of ions, proteins like albumin and other solutes, keeping it isotonic with our cells. Kidneys play a huge role in regulating this. Okay, here's something really cool from the reading storing fuel. Why store glucose as big glycogen polymers instead of lots of little glucose molecules? Ah, yes. That's a brilliant osmotic strategy. Imagine if a liver cell stored all its glucose reserve as individual glucose molecules. The concentration inside would be incredibly high leading to massive osmotic pressure, water rushing in. Exactly. The cell would likely burst. But by linking thousands of glucose units into one giant glycogen molecule, hmm. it only counts osmotically as, essentially, one particle. Clever. Minimizes the osmotic stress. Very clever. It's also why, in the lab, if you want to isolate organelles like mitochondria without damaging them, you have to do it in an isotonic buffer, often containing sucrose keeps them intact. Fascinating. Okay, one more huge topic, pH and buffers. This is all about acidity and keeping things stable. Absolutely vital. It starts with water itself. While we think of it as H2O, a tiny fraction of water molecules actually ionize. They reversibly split into a hydrogen ion, H plus O, and a hydroxide ion. OH. Just a tiny fraction, though. Extremely tiny, but crucial. And mm -hmm. technically, the H plus doesn't exist freely. It immediately attaches to another water molecule to form a hydronium ion, H3O plus de, but we often just write H plus for simplicity. And these protons can move really fast. Incredibly fast, through a process called proton hopping. It's not one proton diffusing through the water, it's like a relay race, where a proton jumps onto one water and that water releases another proton to the next one down a chain of hydrogen-bonded molecules. It makes acid-base reactions in water almost instantaneous. Wow, okay, so water has this equilibrium between H2O, H plus air, and OH. Right. And at 25 degrees C, the product of the H plus and OH concentrations is always constant, a value called Kw, which is 1.0 a 0.14. So if you know one, you know the other. Exactly. In pure neutral water, the concentrations are equal. Both are 10 to 7 molar. And that leads us to the pH scale. Yes, pH is just the more convenient way to express the H plus concentration. It's the negative logarithm base 10 of the H plus concentration. So pH dash log H plus same. That neutral point 10 to 7 mH plus becomes pH 7. Right. And because it's a log scale, each pH unit represents a tenfold difference in H plus concentration. So going from pH 7 to pH 6 means 10 times more H plus pH 7 to pH 5 is 100 times more. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Which is why small pH changes can be biologically significant. Think about blood pH, normally around 7.4. If it drops below 7.35, that's acidosis. Above 7.45 is alkalosis both are dangerous. That narrow range is critical for life. So how is it maintained? That brings us to acids, bases, and buffers. Okay, so we have strong acids and bases, which dissociate completely in water, and weak acids and bases, which only partially dissociate. Biological systems are full of weak acids and bases. Remind us, an acid donates a proton, a base accepts one. Correct. And when a weak acid, HA, loses its proton, it forms its conjugate base. A, they exist in equilibrium. HA, H plus plus A. And how much it dissociates depends on the specific weak acid. Yes. Each weak acid has an acid dissociation constant, Ka. A stronger weak acid has a larger Ka, meaning it gives up its proton more readily. We often use pKa, which is a loka. Lower pKa means stronger acid. And you can measure pKa day using titration curves. You can. If you gradually add a strong base to a weak acid and plot the pH change, you get a titration curve. The midpoint of that curve, where half the acid has been neutralized, HAHA, is where pH equals pKa. And that midpoint is important for buffering. Exactly. Because yeah. that's the region where the pH changes least upon addition of acid or base. That's what a buffer does. It resists changes in pH. So a buffer is essentially a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate base. That's right. If you add H plus to the buffer solution, the conjugate base A picks it up, reforming HA. If you add OH, the weak acid HA donates its proton to neutralize the OH, forming water and A. The equilibrium shifts, but the overall pH change is minimized. And buffers work best near their pKa. Yes, the effective buffering range is typically about one pH unit above and below the pKa. 
There's a handy equation, the henderson hasselbalch equation, pH, BQL plus log, AHA, that lets you calculate the pH of a buffer or figure out the ratio of A to HA needed for a specific pH. What are the key buffer systems in our bodies? Two major ones. Inside cells, the phosphate buffer system, H2PO40 to PO42, is critical. Its pKa is 6.86, which is very close to the typical intracellular pH, making it highly effective there. Okay, phosphate inside cells, what about in the blood? In blood plasma, the bicarbonate buffer system, H2CO3, H2O3, is king. It's a bit more complex because it's linked to dissolved CO2 and the CO2 gas in our lungs. How does that work? CO2 dissolves in blood, reacts with water to form carbonic acid, H2CO3, right. which then dissociates into H plus and bicarbonate H2O3. Exactly. There are multiple linked equilibria, CO2 gas in lungs, CO2 dissolved in blood, plus H2CO3, H plus, plus HCO3. Now, the pKa for the H2CO3 dissociation is around 6.1 or so, which seems a bit low to buffer effectively at blood pH 7.4. That's the fascinating part. It works so well because it's an open system connected to that huge reservoir of CO2 gas in the lungs. Your body can rapidly adjust the CO2 levels through breathing. Ah, so if blood gets too acidic, too much H+, plus, yeah. the equilibrium shifts left, yeah. forming more H2CO3, which then breaks down into CO2 and water, and you breathe faster to expel the extra CO2. Exactly. Your brainstem detects the pH change and increases respiration. Conversely, if blood becomes too alkaline, breathing slows, retaining CO2, pushing the equilibrium right, generating more H plus to lower the pH. That's why hyperventilating, blowing off too much CO2 can cause alkalosis. Right. And the old remedy of breathing into a paper bag works because you re-inhale the CO2, pushing the equilibrium back towards normal. It's a beautifully integrated physiological system. It really is. And the clinical side of this, pH affects enzymes so much. Critically, enzymes have optimal pH ranges, deviate even slightly, and their activity can plummet because the ionization states of amino acid residues crucial for structure or catalysis change. Like in untreated diabetes. A classic example of metabolic acidosis. When cells can't use glucose properly, they burn excessive amounts of fat, producing acidic ketone bodies like hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. These acids build up in the blood. Lowering the pH below 7.35. This acidosis messes with enzyme function throughout the body, leading to severe symptoms, drowsiness, coma, convulsions. It highlights just how vital pH regulation is. Other things can cause acidosis too, right? Like kidney failure or lung disease? Yes, or even intense exercise producing lactic acid or prolonged fasting. Treatments often involve addressing the underlying cause, like giving insulin for diabetes, or sometimes administering bicarbonate intravenously to directly counteract the acidity. So looking back, we started with just water, H2O. But its simple structure leads to hydrogen bonding, polarity. Which then explains its solvent properties, the hydrophobic effect, how membranes form, how proteins fold. And then there's the subtle ionization, the whole pH scale, and these intricate buffering systems, especially bicarbonate, linked directly to our breathing. It all connects. These seemingly basic chemical principles, weak interactions, entropy, equilibria, are the absolute foundation of biochemistry and physiology. They dictate how everything works at the molecular level to keep us alive and functioning within remarkably tight parameters. It really gives you an appreciation for the elegance of it all. Mm. Just think about that hydrogen bond, this tiny fleeting electrostatic attraction. Multiply it billions upon billions of times, orchestrate it with these other weak forces and chemical equilibria. And you get the basis for self-replicating, energy-transducing, incredibly complex systems we call life, all operating within the very specific chemical environment provided and maintained by water. It's quite something. A constant dynamic balancing act happening inside us every second, all thanks to the unique chemistry of water. It makes you realize how much invisible work goes into just being. Well, that's all the time we have for this deep dive. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep being curious.